This is the European Union, 27 diverse countries that came together, representing a colossal population of over 440 million souls. To put that into perspective, that's more than the United States. Yet when it comes to military prowess, the EU doesn't quite measure up. Consider this, the European Union juggles 30 different types of battle tanks, manages a whopping 20 varieties of aircraft, and to top it all off, houses 27 distinct military headquarters. Meanwhile the US, just one headquarters, with a handful of tanks and aircraft types. Think about it, if Europe shared resources and worked more closely together, couldn't it be stronger in NATO and less dependent on the US? Surprisingly, the US has often stopped Europe from doing this. They believe EU countries should spend more on their own armies and focus on NATO, not on creating new joint military setups. In this video, we'll dive into the evolution of European defense since World War II, the challenges facing European militaries today, and the two distinct paths forward the EU could take, focus solely on NATO or a European army as part of NATO. We are also delighted to have a former Italian general make a guest appearance, who will give us a bit more insight into his vision for European defense. The idea of a unified European military is not a new one. Right after World War II, Europe was left with a pivotal challenge, how to reintegrate West Germany without reviving old fears of its military might. The French Prime Minister came up with a plan in 1950 to establish a unified European army. This would mean that West German military units would be integrated with those of other European nations, ensuring no singular dominant force. The US supported the idea of a united strong Europe against the Soviet Union. Although six countries optimistically signed the Treaty for a European Defense Community, France's National Assembly unexpectedly rejected it in 1954. This led to a shift from military to economic integration, laying the groundwork for the European Economic Community. After the Cold War in 1992, the European Community transformed into the European Union. This wasn't just a name change, the EU dramatically broadened its horizons, moving beyond economics into political integration, with foreign policy and defense now a key EU pillar. Soon after, two of Europe's heavyweights, the UK Prime Minister and the French President, jointly recognized the EU's need for autonomous military action, backed by credible forces. This worried the US, who became increasingly concerned that a strengthened EU defense might overshadow NATO. With the Soviet Union dissolved and NATO's future role uncertain, the US Secretary of State introduced the three Ds for the EU. No duplication, meaning the EU should not mirror NATO efforts. No discrimination, meaning the EU defense policies should not sideline non-EU NATO members. And no decoupling, meaning the EU must sustain strong ties with NATO. Despite these concerns, however, the EU pressed ahead with its defense objectives and established the Helsinki headline goal in 1999. As one of the four drafters of the Helsinki headline goal in 1999, when we designed a plan for a deployable force of 60,000 soldiers, along with ships and planes, sustainable for at least six months. In 2000, US opposition to EU defense plans intensified, with the Secretary of Defense warning that NATO could become a relic of the past if the EU established a rapid reaction force. This reflected US concerns that an EU defense force might undermine NATO and reduce US influence in Europe. Under US pressure and with differing views in the EU, particularly from the new Eastern European members, the idea of a 60,000 member rapid reaction force did not take off. By 2004, the EU opted for a change in strategy, emphasizing smaller teams known as battle groups. Typically consisting of around 1,500 troops each, these groups were designed to act quickly, addressing emergencies without the need for a large army. Ever since, tensions between the EU and the US have persisted, but no longer around EU military integration, but rather spending targets. Both Obama and Trump voiced concerns about European nations not meeting the 2% of GDP defense spending benchmark. Trump even threatened to leave NATO if European members did not spend their fair share. I have been very, very direct with Secretary Stoltenberg and members of the alliance 
in saying that NATO members must finally contribute their fair share and meet their financial obligations. But 23 of the 28 member nations are still not paying what they should be paying and what they are supposed to be paying for their defense. But if the U.S. truly desired a strong European defense partner, wouldn't encouraging a unified European defense strategy make more sense? This is something we will look at later in this video. Looking back, the U.S. strategy in the 1990s achieved its aims. History suggests it wasn't about making the EU a global powerhouse, but about keeping NATO at the forefront, bringing Eastern European countries into NATO, and ensuring that the U.S. remained key to European security. As a result, Europe today, despite its wealth, still heavily relies on U.S. military strength. But this doesn't mean that EU member states don't allocate resources to their militaries. In fact, EU member states collectively allocated a staggering 246 billion euros for military expenditure in 2022. Now that's substantial, isn't it? When you stack this against Russia's 82 billion euros, you might find yourself wondering, is Europe actually a military superpower? Surprisingly, when we compare EU military spending against other global heavyweights, it secures third spot, trailing not too far behind China. Yet despite this large military spend, most EU countries cannot deploy forces, run out of ammunition and spare parts when they fight, and have shockingly low levels of readiness. Especially Germany, the EU's largest defense spender, is currently facing a significant military crisis. In a striking interview, a former top German general described the German military as being in its worst state ever, lacking the capability to defend both Germany and its allies, and even posing a significant risk to itself. This situation has even led to light-hearted but critical comments from NATO allies. Like, why are the Germans only terrible at war when they're on our side? So should Germany spend more? Probably. But we argue that the core issue with European defense isn't about spending levels, which are substantial, but rather structural problems, starting with limited interoperability and duplication. During the 2011 NATO intervention in Libya, European air forces struggled because their different planes, like French Rafales, British Eurofighters, and Italian Tornadoes, needed unique and different care. This made joint operations like refueling and strikes hard, showing the need for more standardization in European military planes. Today, EU militaries collectively use over 30 different types of tanks, nearly 20 types of combat aircraft, and more than 10 types of tanker aircraft. The variety of equipment complicates joint training and operations, as different units require access to various spare parts and components. EU members use a staggering 178 different major weapon systems, compared to the United States' 30. Europe also faces higher defense costs due to missed economies of scale. McKinsey reports that joint equipment procurement could save Europe 30% in costs, about $15 billion annually. So what is the best way forward for European defense? Should the European Union take a bigger role? Well, we see two ways forward. The first option is NATO leads the way for European defense and the European Union takes a secondary role. For this scenario, the NATO chief, Jens Stoltenberg, has already outlined a concise vision for European defense, focusing on three main aspects. Firstly, he emphasizes NATO's critical role as the bedrock of security, underlying its importance in ensuring regional stability and peace. Secondly, he encourages EU countries to increase their defense spending to meet the 2% of GDP spending target. And thirdly, he opposes the EU creating structures that would duplicate NATO's functions, advocating for a singular strong command structure. Under this approach, EU NATO members would commit to spending at least 2% of their GDP on defense without channeling additional resources towards further European integration. At EU Made Simple, we agree with the NATO chief's assertion that NATO is essential for Europe's security. However, we have some doubts about the second point, and particularly the third point. Yes, some European countries should definitely spend more on defense, but for us the bigger concern is how this money is spent. Without changing EU structures, the same problems exist as mentioned before. The EU will duplicate capabilities, suffer from lack of interoperability, and cannot take advantage of economies of scale. 
Furthermore, the French president said Europe should not raise our defense budgets just to purchase US-made weapons. This is simply not in the EU's interest, and we agree. Looking at you, Germany, what were you thinking? This brings us to Stoltenberg's third point. EU integration might duplicate NATO structures. This argument seems illogical. Isn't this already happening at a much larger extent today? Currently, we have one NATO command structure alongside 30 separate command structures for each NATO member. Wouldn't NATO be stronger with a unified European pillar, where 22 EU member states are represented under one singular umbrella? This principle also applies to developing military capabilities. Consider Latvia, a NATO member, that spends the agreed 2% of its GDP on defense, resulting in a military budget of just 800 million euros. To put this into perspective, with such a budget, Latvia could afford an aircraft carrier only once every decade or so, and that's without spending on any other military needs. In comparison, the US spends not a hundred, but a thousand times more, and can build a navy as well as an air force and army. This highlights the limitations faced by smaller countries, and emphasizes the need for Europe to work together. Relying only on NATO means depending on the US and their plans. As the US focuses more on the Pacific, and with conflicts closer to us, it's important for Europe to handle its own defense. This leads us to our second option. The EU leads the way for European defense, while NATO takes a secondary role. Now, to be very clear, this does not make NATO obsolete. In fact, some argue it could do the very opposite. A stronger EU within NATO can strengthen the alliance with more capabilities and more military readiness. So what role would the EU take here? Well, the EU already manages a number of defense capabilities through the Common Security and Defense Policy, where member states work together to conduct missions and operations abroad, including peacekeeping and conflict prevention, with member states contributing personnel, troops, naval forces and experts, maintain rapid reaction battle groups, which comprise of 1,500 strong military units prepared for swift deployment, promote joint military equipment and technology development through PESCO, which is currently overseeing 68 projects, facilitate defense cooperation among member states through the European Defense Agency, and support defense capability development through the European Defense Fund, with a budget of 13 billion euros over seven years. While this might sound like a good start, there are problems. The European Defense Fund is so small that it can't have a real impact. To illustrate, the EDF seven-year budget is less than what the Netherlands, a relatively small country, allocates to its military in one single year. Also, the EU battle groups have never been deployed due to slow political decision-making, despite their potential usefulness in plenty of situations over the last two decades. And PESCO projects are continuously delayed, such as the joint effort between France and Germany to develop a new European main battle tank. So how can things improve? Well, the EU should first decide what role they would like to play, and we have pinpointed four possible options. Firstly, the EU as an enabler. The EU could bring together resources to develop important military equipment, like drones, transport planes, and defense systems. These would be owned by the EU, but available for both EU and NATO to use, with the EU handling operations and maintenance. Secondly, the EU as an industrial defense integrator. The EU could play a key role in uniting the European defense industry. This would require EU-level spending to encourage companies across Europe to work together. Currently, each country's defense industry operates independently, making integration challenging. Thirdly, a full-on EU army. Here the EU would create a new European military, drawing recruits from the 450 million people in the EU. This would involve creating new training programs, strategies, and organizational structures, a process that could take decades, relying initially on support from member states' militaries. Eventually, however, this could replace current national militaries. Fourthly, there's an army of Europeans. An army of Europeans would be an alternative to a full-on EU army. This would be a flexible force of around 60,000 soldiers from various EU countries, sharing equipment and training together, including annual joint exercises. This force wouldn't replace national armies, but would be an additional collaborative effort, 
countries could choose to integrate their troops into this EU force or maintain separate national forces that work alongside it. The EU would also pool resources for advanced military equipment to support the European army. But such an approach requires a common strategy and vision. And our sponsor of today's video, the Union of European Federalists, have a clear opinion they want to share. European defense is not possible without a political union. Fundamentally, we are discussing a tool of foreign policy, a policy that requires coordinated use of various instruments to achieve collective goals. Thus, the essential task is to define clearly and comprehensively these shared objectives agreed upon by European member states. Only then can we develop an appropriate and effective toolkit, including the military component, namely the European Armed Forces. An example of this issue is the establishment of Eurofor, a multinational deployable headquarters formed by France, Italy, Portugal and Spain in the late 90s. Located in Florence and initially successful in Balkan interventions, Eurofor faced a deadlock when space vetoed its involvement in Kosovo following the declaration of independence by Kosovars. Even after years of negotiation, we could not overcome our disagreement and eventually Eurofor had to be disbanded. This teaches the European Union an important lesson. To make a real difference in the world and handle crisis well, its countries need to share clear common foreign policy goals and ways of making decisions, removing once and for all the concept of unanimity. To this day, the vision of 60,000 strong EU deployable force remains unfulfilled, locked in a drawer. Reviving this concept might appear as merely a dream, yet, as the famous saying goes, I have a dream. A heartfelt shout out to our sponsor, the Union of European Federalists. Since 1946, this cross-border, non-governmental political collective has passionately advocated for a European Federation, uniting dedicated individuals in this vision. Here's what we think at the EU Made Simple. Europe needs to wake up and start taking ownership of protecting our continent. We simply cannot rely on the US anymore for two key reasons. Firstly, unpredictable leadership, as exemplified by figures like Trump. Such leaders raise the possibility of the US withdrawing from NATO. Secondly, the US is shifting a strategic focus towards Asia, diverging from Europe's strategic interests. Strategic autonomy is a tricky concept. Some argue that it means Europe should entirely separate from the Euro-Atlantic community, including countries like Canada, the US and the UK, and operate completely independently. However, we hold the view that it means Europe can act on its own when it's in Europe's interest to do so. Some geopolitical conflicts might be high priority for the EU, but not so much for the US, and the EU should have the capability to act without the US at its side. The best way to achieve this is to work together and align our foreign policy. And this is already starting to happen. European states have begun to integrate their forces with each other out of necessity. For instance, the Netherlands put two of its three Dutch army brigades under German command. This has spread to some integration of the German and Dutch navies as well. In addition to these efforts, European countries are collaborating on projects like the European main battle tank and the future combat air system, a new fighter jet. We want to see more of this and actually really like the idea of the EU as an enabler and the army of Europeans. This approach allows the EU to develop military capabilities that NATO currently lacks, while also having a defense force that can safeguard European interests worldwide. It also positions Europe as a more robust partner within NATO, equally matched with the United States. We think the US should support this strategy, rather than simply focusing on the 2% spending target, as it would have a much greater impact on NATO's ability to make an impact around the globe. But what role do you think the EU should take? We'd love to hear from you, so please leave a comment letting us know your thoughts. And a big thank you to our contributors, who volunteered to help with the video. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe if you enjoyed the content. And if you want to support the channel further, please sign up to Patreon. Until next time.